Hi and welcome to Watt Circuit. So this is the uh, third video in our introduction to filter series. So uh, last time we looked at uh, properly designing, building and verifying a, a fixed frequency state variable filter. In this video we're going to look at, first of all, just a sort of quick overview of some of the techniques you can use uh, to vary, vary the frequency uh, of the filter. And then we're actually going to uh, build up one of those and actually just look at the performance using some of the tools that we've seen before. So this, vi this video we're going to look at uh, switch resistor techniques. Okay, so we've designed a fixed frequency filter with a cutoff frequency of 10 kHz and that works really well. Now how can we make it variable? So, we've got to change some components on here to be able to change the cutoff frequency. Now the simplest way of doing that generally is change R4 and R5. So you've only got to change two resistors and the resistors always stay at the same value. So as you change them, all you want to do is make sure they change and they stay the same, or whatever you've changed them to. So we're going to look at a few different ways of doing it in this video, some of the more basic ways. Then in some follow-on videos, there are actually some other ways, again, of doing it. We're going to look at some of those as well. But let's start with three ways in this video. So initially, what you could do, you could take those two and say, well, I'm changing a resistor. Let's put a variable resistor in there, just a standard potentiometer. So if you do something like this, you can put a fixed resistor in series and use a potentiometer just as a variable resistor by leaving one pin unconnected, tying the output or the input to the wiper and tying the other one, the other pin, just to make up, make up the circuit. So we always want to really include that fixed resistor in there because that gives us an upper frequency cutoff for our filter. We don't want to be able to turn the resistance down to zero generally. So you do want a fixed resistor in there. This is a nice straightforward way of doing it, but there are some downsides with this. So generally potentiometers aren't that accurate. So, you know, it might be plus or minus 20%, that kind, of, uh, that kind of figure. And more than that, you've got to be changing two resistors at the same time. So to do that, you're going to need a dual gang potentiometer. So that's two potentiometers, both attached to the same shaft. Downside of that is that the two potentiometers just aren't necessarily going to track the same. So where they don't track the same, that does have some implications to the filter. It doesn't quite cut off as cleanly, and you do just generally degrade the performance of the filter somewhat. It is doable, and of course, yeah, you know, if you're talking about potentiometer, that implies you're changing it by hand, and therefore a bit of variation in tolerance doesn't really matter because if it's not quite right, you're just going to keep changing it. You effectively got human in the uh, feedback loop. <laughs> nice and simple. But uh, let's say we want to do it under computer control. So we could do exactly the same thing, but instead of using a potentiometer with a shaft net, we could put a digital potentiometer on there. So with one of those, you can either have ones with a really simple up-down interface where you give them a pulse to make them a high resistance value and a pulse to make them lower resistance value. Or we've got more sophisticated ones, which have got something like an SPI or an I squared C bus on there. Either way, they all work pretty much the same kind of way. Generally speaking, digipots actually have the same kind of tolerances issue as, uh, you know, as normal potentiometers. They're not generally high, uh, high performance, with the exception of one analog device's digipot, which is about 1% tolerance and a very nice part. But you're going to pay a premium for that, and so be it. And also, again, you're, in, you're also into the uh, matching. Even for the potentiometers which are quite highly specified, you've still got wiper resistance on there, which can have a surprisingly large effect, particularly down at the low resistance values. And uh, those just aren't matched very well from part to part. So assume you don't want to go for a potentiometer, what other options are there? So one which I really like is actually what's called a switched resistor. So if we put a fixed resistor in here, so again, if we're doing a variable filter from 1 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz, let's say. 10 kilohertz is our highest frequency, so this resistor is going to set our highest frequency. So from our example before, we saw that's uh, 1,600 ohm resistor we've put in there. So if we leave that switch on all the time, then you've just got 1,600 ohm, res uh, yeah, ohm resistor in there, and you're going to get a 10 kilohertz cutoff frequency. But the nice thing, these resistors are actually going into integrators. So let's say we take that switch and we apply a pulse width modulation signal to it. So we turn it on, and we turn it off, and we do this fairly quickly. So let's say we leave it on 50% of the time. 
This means that on average the integrator is only going to get halfway as high as it would have done before. So that's the same as having a resistor value of twice the resistor value we've actually put in there. So using this, if we take it from a 100% duty cycle to a 10% duty cycle, we actually get a, one ki a yeah, 10 kilohertz to a 1 kilohertz filter. Downsides of this, you've got to have something to drive, drive it, but then microcontrollers uh, with uh, pulse width modulation are pretty commonplace and also pretty inexpensive. So that's, you know, that's actually quite a straightforward way of doing it. Other downsides, as your filter frequency starts to get faster, particularly if you want to cover a wide range, let's say you want to cover two decades, so you want to go from, let's say, a megahertz down to 10 kilohertz. So that's a megahertz down to 100 kilohertz down to 10 kilohertz. That means you've got to go down to a 1% duty cycle, which means you've got to switch it really, really quickly. If you're going to be able to turn it on and off for 1% of the time, and for it not to affect the overall output, that's got to be a really fast switch. So generally this sort of tactic only really works at the lower speeds, and it also you'll find a restriction how many decades you can switch. So that's on the downsides. Uh, in addition to that, we talked about the switching frequency. You have to make sure your switching frequency is well above your cutoff frequency. So for our example, where you've got 100 kilohertz, sorry, uh, yeah, 10 kilohertz filter, you want your switching frequency at least to be a decade above that, so you really want a minimum of 100 kilohertz switching frequency. Otherwise, you're actually going to get basically some of the frequency that you're switching appearing on the outputs, and that's not good because it's not the signal you put in at the start. So, let's say you want to do slightly higher frequencies, you can really cope with the switch resistor. The third option we're going to look at in this video is actually putting an analog multiplier circuit in there. So this is just an integrated circuit, you buy it off the shelf, you put a signal in, which is your signal coming from this circuit here, you've got some kind of control signal, which again just another voltage in, it multiplies the two voltages together, and then gives you an output which is equal to the two multiplied together, and then with more sophisticated ICs, you, and you can multiply it by a constant, quite commonly one or ten or a tenth, and this circuit works really nicely. Generally, you'll also want your fixed resistor here as well, uh, just to give it the right impedance loading and that sort of thing, and yeah, it just makes that work rather well. So, we've got three different options. I'm not going to build the uh, Digipot up, because there's not really a lot of advantages to building that up. But what I will do, let's build up the switch resistor, and let's build up the multiplier option. Let's have a look at their performance, see how they compare. And one disadvantage of the multiplier option, which I uh, forgot to mention, doesn't have many disadvantages, but the big one, cost. Analog multipliers, by and by, are expensive ICs. Uh, the ones that I'm actually going to be using in the prototype that we're building up today uh, is actually about £20 per IC. You can get them much more inexpensively than that, but when you talk about precision applications, these things just aren't cheap. So, yeah, let's have a look at the uh, performance of those, do a quick comparison. So one of the really nice things about this technique is all I've done, we've just broken a couple of connections here, taken them down to a second board which we've just soldered across onto, and now we've just added in some extra circuitry, this is where we're going to build up the little switcher IC, and again just put a little BNC connector on the side, that's ready to feed our uh, pulse width modulation signal into. So yeah, really quick and easy to prototype. So let's get this over and uh, let's take some measurements. So now we're looking at the filter using the um, switching IC. Now, just due to the fact I was limited on which switching ICs I had around, um, I've chosen the one which had the fastest on and off time in my drawer, uh, which happens to be the rather venerable uh, HEF4066. So 4066 is a real classic uh, analog switch, um, and this is a CMOS type. Unfortunately, due to the voltage supply limitations of this, um, I can't actually run it on the full plus minus 15 volts, so instead we're just using the same circuit, but I've just taken the voltage supply down to plus minus 7 volts. Um, so as you can see on the screen, we've got the uh, network analyzer function running here. Uh, we've got the output currently um, attached up to the low pass output. 
and at the moment I'm feeding a 100 kilohertz uh, square wave into the control signal. So, um, and we've also got this on about 99% due to cycle, it's all on almost all the time. So you can see because of that, we've got um, nice roll off with minus three dB point, uh, just a little bit below 10 kilohertz. So that's working really nicely. So if we just grab a snapshot of that, so we'll have a, um, we'll keep that image as a dotted image, even as the live one updates. Let's start to take that due to cycle down a bit. So if we drop that down to 80% uh, and let's watch that run again. Now you can see the um, cutoff frequency dropping quite nicely there. And let's quickly drop down to 50% now. So we should see about a halving in the cutoff frequency and that's exactly what we see. So this is actually working really nicely. Let's drop that again. Let's take it down to about 10% which is about as low as I want to go for this. And we can see, so we've got a nice full decade of adjustment on there, right away from 10 kilohertz to 1 kilohertz. However, we said about change as we um, drop the duty cycle there, one of the big limitations of this, so with a duty cycle of um, 10%, 100 kilohertz, that's, that's quite a short on time. And if you want to extend that to another decade, that means you need a 1% uh, duty cycle, which means you're getting into you know, microsecond or at least sort of tens, hundreds of microseconds on off times, which means your rise and fall times for your signal, for your analog switch have to be really ultra quick. So that means that you know, out at the higher frequency ranges that this technique really is limited. But while we've got this playing, let's have a look at some of the other outputs as well. So if we uh, move that snapshot and let's just move our capture signal from the low pass to high pass output on there and we'll just wait for that to rebuild itself so this is still with 10% due to cycles this is a low cutoff frequency that works really nicely and then let's take that up to 50% due to cycle which wait for that to refresh As you can see, it's actually a really elegant control method, just using very cheap, very straightforward parts. You get very good performance indeed. And let's just take that up to 99% again. So if you're doing lower frequency work, even, you know, and let's say um, audio work should be quite doable like this, you get very good results out of it. And that's lovely. So that's our, you know, well, that's our one decade adjustment on there. So low pass works really well. High pass works really well. Let's have a look at the band pass. And we'll just wait for that to rebuild. So this is the 99% due to cycle. So we back up the uh, 10 kilohertz center frequency again. And that works really nicely. So let's just take it over its range of adjustment again. So let's do 50% due to cycle. And you're getting a really nice consistent peak on that. So yeah, really, really happy about it came out. And put a snapshot back on there so we can see change in performance. 10%. And we'll do that rebuild. Rescale on there. And I say, yeah, carry on with what we uh, covered in the very first video. For doing this sort of filter design work, having the analog discovery or some kind of network analyzer is really useful for this kind of work. And it makes, if, you, um, if you're trying to do a scan on the uh, oscilloscope with a function generator, it's, it's definitely workable. But getting this, you know, it's doing multiple readings to really get you down to low signal levels, doing a lot of really good techniques, and it's, it's just so much, useful, uh, so much easier. So let's have a go while we're here. Let's see, can we take the juice cycle down even further? Let's try 1% and let's see what the results are with that. Okay, so we're just going off the edge of the screen. So let's just take that down to uh, 10 hertz. And as you can see, you know, start to hit lower frequencies. It actually takes longer to plot. So there we are, actually, you know you can get two decades of adjustment out of this really quite and works very well indeed so yeah really good technique this one so in this video we've seen how we can take a uh, state variable filter and make it a variable frequency 
and get some really quite good results out of it. As we mentioned at the beginning, there are some limitations to the switch resistor technique. And the other technique that we want to look at is uh, using analog multipliers. So the next video coming up, we're going to uh, take a quick hand through analog multipliers. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, as always, if you liked it, please give us a like or a thumbs up. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for the next video.